Hi, I'm Sam Matthews, and I have a great privilege to be involved with the Arise Conference right here in Cardiff, Wales. It's a very special year. I know you know that, but you don't want to miss what God is doing because He's going to mount up in us as wings as eagles. He's going to take us higher, and you have the opportunity to be right here at Freedom Church, Trade Street. Be here. You can get your tickets at UKarise.com. And you may be seated. If you'll take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John. Now, that's not the Gospel of John. It's 1 John. That one's towards the end of the Bible. And the last chapter, you have three what they call letters back there, epistles or letters. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. It's the first of those. It is written by the Apostle John. He was the last one. Um, uh, who was alive as far as the original apostles? He died in later in the last or in the first century, somewhere in the 90s. So he was the longest living, and he is the only one that died really of natural causes. We know from history that he was probably in Ephesus that he lived his final days. So when you read about you know the church in Ephesus, that was where John kind of retired. He would often, um, when he got to be so old that he couldn't really walk anymore, there were others that would literally carry John around and he would go and speak to the different churches, the different congregations. You know what his one refrain was most of the time? Love one another. You think that John, after all that he'd seen, he saw the book of Revelation like playing. He was like, he was, at, you know, the first, <laughs> he saw the first run of the movie, so to speak. He was there and he saw these events and he's with Jesus. He writes these books and he's writing now. But the one thing after all the revelation that he's had, tremendous truths, seeing Jesus die and rise, being one of the first ones to the tomb, you know, he's, he's like had a lot of revelation. He sees Jesus, a revelation, and he sees eyes of fire, hair, you know, will, like, you know lightning. He's, he sees this stuff. And, the, and his, one, his one message to the church was love one another. How important do you think that is? Hmm. Anyway, that wasn't what we're looking at this morning. We'll pull up in verse 9 here. It says, if we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his, of his Son. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. That's quite a, quite a little passage there. I, I've met many who have said that they, they've become Christian. And I'm going to use that in kind of quotes where they're like, yeah, I've, I prayed a prayer one day. Somebody met me on the street and... Uh, led me in this little prayer about Jesus, something about him. And so, yeah, I guess I'm Christian. And then as soon as, as, soon as the trials, difficulties appear, they, they're like, well, I don't really know if I'm Christian. <laughs> and sometimes you have people who go to church all their life. And they serve, they help, they maybe even come into leadership. And... And, and as soon as you press it just a little bit and you ask him, do they know 
that they belong to Jesus? Do they know that they have life? Do they know with an assurance that I'm his and he's mine? And they say no. In fact, there was one time I was preaching on the streets and I did like a, a sketch word like this that was kind of a bit different. And I was out in Queen Street and I was sharing the gospel of Jesus. And, and I made the statement that I'm going to heaven and no one can stop me. And this man came running at me and he was mad. He was frothing at the mouth. He's saying, you can't say that. You can't know that. I said, are you, are you Christian? Yeah, I'm Christian. I'm thinking, mm. you can't know that. You can't have assurance that you belong to Jesus. You can't know whether you're going to heaven or not. And that's not what the Bible teaches. I'm grateful for the Bible. I'm grateful for God's word because God's word is truth. It doesn't contain the truth. It doesn't just contain the truth. It, it doesn't just speak about the truth. It is truth. Jesus said, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. It is truth. And something about truth is truth never changes. Now that went silent there. Because in our day, you have your truth and I have my truth. That's not called truth, that's called opinion. <laughs> Opinions, everybody has one. Truth is unchanging. Truth doesn't stop being true because of popular opinion. Truth doesn't ever change. That's why when God speaks, it's always true. He doesn't, he doesn't change his mind. He doesn't say, like in some religions, that or you, you, you can't behave this way on earth, but when you get to heaven, you can do all that stuff. I've heard them, and well, on earth you can't drink wine, but when you get to heaven, it's flowing with wine. When you, immorality is wrong, but when you get to heaven, you can have all you want. That is so weird. Because God in his character never changes. He's eternal. His word stands firm. That's why we can trust in what God says. So when God says something about something, we know that it's truth. It's not not an opinion of man. This is God's truth. And God's truth at the end of the day is the only thing that counts. I know that's unpopular in our day, but I don't really care. Because either you agree with God or you call him a liar. <laughs> that's what God says here in his word. He said, we receive the witness of men... Verse 9, but the witness of God is greater. Is that okay? We, we clear so far? What men say changes. People say, I do, and I'll love you forever. And then they don't. Yeah? People say, I promise. And what happens? People even go to court. <laughs> I swear and they know they're not. But we do take people at their word. We do it all the time. What time do you want me to meet you? Will you pay me back? The check's in the mail. <laughs> and we accept the witness of man. I've done security work, and your witness statement is really important. What you saw, how you were involved, what happened. It can be the difference between someone being uh, someone who did something wrong from being let off and then going to jail for it. But we receive the witness of men, and the witness of men is fallible. Christmas time just passed, and your children listened to what you said. 
about things that weren't true. You get my drift? That dude doesn't come. Oh, but you got your children to trust in your witness of that. I can do this after Christmas because then I can't get in much trouble for it. So when you do it before Christmas, everyone gets mad. He doesn't exist. You want your children to trust you? Tell them the truth. There's a difference between reality and fantasy. You get a whole 300 and whatever days left to get that one ready. But we receive the witness of men all the time. We do it in court. We do it when, when people, when we have loans and someone comes in and they're your co-signer. It's not a good idea to co-sign for people. But sometimes that happens, and, and, but they take your witness and we receive it. God's witness is so much further and so much more powerful, so much more clear and accurate because he sees things as they really are. He doesn't look at the outward appearance. He's not impressed with the deception of people. He doesn't get flattered. He doesn't get conned. God cannot be mocked. God is absolutely, he knows, not the outside, the inside. He knows. You know, when Judas was hanging with Jesus, Jesus knew what was in him. In John chapter 2 into chapter 3, Jesus knew, it says, what was in the, men's, in the hearts of men, and he did not entrust himself to anyone because he knew what was in them. He knows the witness of God is greater. The witness of God is truthful. The veracity of God's word, the unchanging nature of God's immutable, unchanging truth. Some big words there. I like them. They're real strong words. The veracity of God's word, the unchangeableness of God's promises. So when God speaks, how should we listen? You know, you teach your children how to listen because they watch you. If you do a good job, you'll be an example, a good one. If you don't, they'll copy you. So when, when he, he speaks, speaks how should we, we listen? listen? What should we do? Because in your hands, we talked on that a little bit this morning in our adult Bible class. Because in your hands, you're holding the witness of God from eternity to eternity. From the beginning of all things, in the beginning, to the end of all things, when the judgment is gone and there's a new creation of heavens and earth. And there in that earth will be, uh, uh, will dwell righteousness. And Jesus will be absolute king. And all of those who have been foreign to it, all of those that are of a lie, of, of, of those that are there, they'll be outside that king. They won't have any part in it. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. God's witness is greater. Can I ask you a couple questions then? If God's witness is greater, then why do we like our opinions more than what he says? I'm going to touch on this one. I can't help it. It's in my spirit. I have to. How many genders are there? Two. God says male and it doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't matter what, what politicians say. It doesn't matter what teachers try to tell you. God says there's two, male, female. It's in the genetics. I'm saying this is what God says. It's not prejudice. It's just a fact. It's amazing. Doctors know it's true, but they're frightened into silence. Because it's the witness of God. This is what God did. 
You have scientists that tell you that you evolved from something smaller. But God says, no, I breathed in you and made you a living being. And I gave you dignity and value and your created, your created value he placed it upon you. No matter what science tries to say and can't prove, the witness of God is greater. So we just sang a song that when you say no, it means, if you say yes, it means, having an affair with someone else's wife doesn't matter how it feels, it's sin, and God says no. Yeah? Sex outside of marriage is sin, God says no. It's the witness of God. You think it's smart to take him at his word and to follow his way? I do. See, this is important, and we as those who claim to know and love the Lord Jesus, because this whole text is really about God's witness about his Son. It says that we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For the witness, um, for this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. Do you know who the Son of God is? Do you know him? Do you know who he is? People are pretty quiet. I hope you know. Otherwise, I'm failing at my job here. My responsibility. Who is the Son of God? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ. Christ is title. It's not his surname. Jesus, who is the Christ. Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Christ. That's a big statement to say that he's the Son of God. He's truly God. Tr the truly God. Before all things, he was there at the beginning, and then he became flesh. So God in all of his fullness, God the Son, I, I do, I believe in what they call a triune God. I believe the Bible teaches it. I believe it shows it. Even at the very beginning, you find God speaks and the Spirit's hovering over the water. That's how many. But there are one, there's two, but there's one. And then the revelation that, that the Christ is actually God, that this is the Son of God. So now that makes three, but they're one. I can't get my head around it. I don't have to. I accept the truth. Lots of things in God's word. You, can you, can you, fig, no, here you go. Let me try this one on you. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. I want you to think about forever in the future. Can you? Oh, yeah, you can. You can think about it. A million years, a million more. Try this one, though. Think back for eternity. You get stuck somewhere. You can't do it. Why? Your brain doesn't work that way because you came into existence at one point in time, but God, he's eternal both ways. Boom, my, my brain pops. I can't get it. It doesn't change the fact that it's true, and I can accept that which is true because it's the testimony God. He's eternal. He's before all things, and in him all things consist. Yeah. And so God became flesh, and he dwelt among us. And we beheld the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So if you saw Jesus, if you had had the privilege to stand there in Jerusalem, hearing him preach, maybe in Galilee, maybe in Jerusalem itself. Hopefully you weren't one of the crowd in Nazareth because they tried to push him off a cliff. But you could hear him and see him. You would have been seeing God with skin on his face. The absoluteness of God, the essence of God. Jesus is so clear in saying, if you've seen me, you've actually seen the Father. In him dwelt all the fullness this is important because some people don't believe. They believe that Jesus is just God's highest created being. And that's not true. They believe, well, he's, you know, he's the firstborn over all creation. That's the place of inheritance, not the place that he created him. 
This is my son and who I'm well pleased. This is a clear relationship. God, and Jesus said it. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus makes it very clear that he is divine. He kept saying in his teaching, I come from heaven and I've come down to do the will of my father. You and I didn't. He came down. Your soul did not exist before. Your soul wasn't in heaven and then came to earth. You weren't part of a reincarnational system where you came back as something else and something else and something else and now you're you. That's not true. You began at a point in time in your mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made. But you began there. Jesus is from everlasting. One of the passages we quote at Christmas time about Jesus from Isaiah 9, isn't it? Verse 6. And I think Grace is going to bring that up onto the screen. This is the Christ. This is who the Christ is. See, because remember, from Isaiah's standpoint, he's speaking the 700 years beforehand. He doesn't know it's going to be Jesus of Nazareth. He just knows that the Christ is coming. And this is who the Christ is. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And his name will be called, pardon me, the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor. What is it? He's God. This is who the Christ will be. He's God. Can I suggest to you, listen, unless the revelation that he is actually God, you won't be saved. You won't worship him. If he's not God. In fact, I'm going to suggest if he's not God, you shouldn't worship him. But he is, and so we do. He's mighty God, everlasting Father. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily in him. This is God's testimony of his Son. You know, this is really important in regards to your salvation. If he's not the Son of God, he doesn't have power to save you. If he's not the son of God, he doesn't have the power to save you. But because he is the son of God and heaven is his throne, it's his throne room, because of that, he has the authority to forgive sin. He has the authority to actually redeem, to make you belong to God. He has the authority to send the spirit of God to give you life. He has the authority to speak with an absolute tone. Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you know how exclusive that is in this day? People say, well, no, that's just his truth. No, that is the truth. And in the end, it won't be Buddha that's sitting on this throne. It won't be Muhammad that's sitting on this throne. It won't be, I don't know, any of the 330 million gods and goddesses of Hinduism that'll be sitting on that throne. It won't be Joseph Smith on that throne. It won't be Michael the archangel sitting on that throne. It is Jesus who is on that throne. This is what the Bible teaches. Now this is important because if you don't recognize him as such and don't submit to him as Lord, you can't have salvation because that means you're still fighting with him. In fact, it's this severe. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. The Holy Spirit gives that. He who does not believe God has made him a liar. Hear me. God is so truthful that to remain neutral is calling him a liar. God is so truthful that when he speaks, sometimes we can be this way. We can even hear preachers and we're like this. And they speak, maybe they're speaking the truth. We want to discern. 
but they speak the truth. And we tell, I don't know if I like that. And so I just won't decide. That's calling God a liar. If you're reading in the Word of God, and you're like, yeah, I know it says it, but I kind of think you just called God a liar. Like, really, is it that severe? Yep. So those aren't even my words. That's what Scripture says. If we don't agree with God's testimony, now specifically, he's talking about the testimony of his son, Jesus, and if we don't receive, not just accept it like passively, but actively adhere to, trust in Jesus, the Son of God, then we call God a liar. And think about the moment, right? Heaven's coming, right? So you're in the queue, everyone's doing the whole judgment thing, and you're standing there, and uh, now it's your turn. Well, let's see, I, I don't see your name in the book of life. Yeah, but I kind of believed you. I mean, you called me a liar and you want to get into my house. That's a bit weird. Isn't it? He's so trustworthy. And this is important. He is trustworthy. Faith is taking God at his word. He has the character to back up everything he says. He has the power to back up everything he says. So when he says he will do something, guess what? He will do it. If he says he's not going to do it, guess what that means? He's not, it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter how I feel or my personal revelation. That's just weird. Actually, that's just deception. <laughs> he speaks. We need to know his word, saints. We need to know what the Bible teaches. And be careful, because we can gather teachers around us who will tell us everything we want to hear. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me say this. If you listen to teachers who tell you just what you want to hear, you're probably already deceived. Because if you're never challenged by the Word of God that they're preaching, and it always just agrees with you, either you're perfect or they're not preaching the truth. <laughs> and you know what I'm saying? And the, fact, the Bible says in the latter days, people will surround themselves with teachers who will tickle their ear. All you have to do is go on YouTube, right? And you can get your playlist of all the people that will tell you what you want to hear. This is the testimony that God gives of his son. This is Jesus. Well, what's this testimony that he's getting to? Well, this is the testimony, verse 11, that God has given us what? eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has, he who is not the Son of God does not have. Okay, is, is that quite clear? No, I'm saying, is, it, is there a line drawn? God draws a line. I, some people don't like clarity. I, I do. I like to know where I'm standing. Really? I mean, really, if I know where I'm standing, if I'm not in the right place, then I get the opportunity to move. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, could you imagine? I mean, the Bible says that it will be in that day that many would say, Lord, Lord, to Jesus. They've said, Lord, Lord. But in that day, they're not standing in the right place and they'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. At that point, it's too late to change. At that point, it's beyond help. It's beyond hope. It's given unto man one time to die and then judgment comes. And once that's done, it's done. There's no way back. And so knowing, can I ask you to, this afternoon, give me a couple more minutes here and we'll finish up. Where are you standing? If you have the son, you have life. If you don't have the son of God, you don't have life. There is no fence. There's no waiting time. Hear me. Some people think, well, I'm at a crossroads. As long as I stand here at the crossroads, I'm safe. No. You either have the Son and have life, or you don't have the Son of God and you don't have life. That's where you stand right here, right now. You either have the Son of God, Jesus, have eternal life, or you don't. These aren't my words. These are God's words. I, I plead with you because Jesus said there'll be many who come to him in that day and said, Lord, Lord, where they're not really his and they pretend. Please don't pretend. You don't have to. 
going to church doesn't make you Christian. Jesus makes you Christian. Receiving the Son, to as many as received him, to them he gave power to become children of God. To those who believe, trust in, adhere to his name. There is no salvation anywhere else. This is serious. Because you can pray a prayer, but I'm telling you, there are religions of the world who pray more than you do. Your prayer won't save you. Having the Son, He saves you. It's a big difference. And it's relationship, it's eternal life. It's not religion. You can go through the motions and not be genuine. We've all done it. You just got done with Christmas. How did you like the gift I gave you? It's nice, thanks. You went through the motions. It wasn't real. You weren't really appreciative. You tried to put on that fake smile. You know, everyone can see through it, so don't even bother. <laughs> but with God, you're either, you either have the Son and have life, or you don't have the Son of God. Let me ask you, when did you receive him? See, now I went quiet. When did you receive him? See, we think, well, just because I'm British. No, that doesn't make you Christian. Um, I've been to church. I've been to New Hope Community Church. That makes me, that doesn't make you Christian. When did you receive him? You should be able to. Now hear me. Some would say, I don't remember the date. Okay, do you remember the event? Do you remember the moment where it clicked for you? You responded to him and said yes to Jesus. He changed your heart. Yeah. You would have gotten baptized because you would have obeyed Jesus in baptism. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's what scripture says. You would have publicly confessed that you belong to him, that you know him. There's a change in your heart. Hallelujah. Now, I, hope it's, I hope it is with you. Now, the greatest thing about it is that change isn't the singular moment. It's a constant working of God in your life. Amen. If you say, well, yeah, I prayed that prayer back in 1952. And there's nothing in your life of eternal life following you. Then you need to be saved. Yeah. You need to put your trust in him now. Today. Yeah. Now, I want to touch on this for just a minute. Because sometimes, hear me, sometimes you have put your trust in Jesus and you still struggle. Yeah? Okay, you don't have to worry. I'm, I'm going to try not to look at anyone for any length of time so you don't think I'm talking directly to you. Yeah, I'm trying to make you feel that. But you may question whether you really are. Peter... When asked, do you know Jesus, what did he say? No. Was he telling the truth? <laughs> when he was asked, are you one of his disciples? The night in which Jesus was betrayed, he was asked, do you know him? Do you belong to him? Are you a follower of Jesus? What did he say? No. Was he? Yes. Yes. My point is this, sometimes you can be, and because of the questions that you feel that are unanswered here, you can maybe say to yourself, I don't know that I am. You might be telling a lie. There was a time when I went to, when I went to Bible college. I was 19 when I came to know Jesus. Went to Bible college and I met these people who were, they were like super saints. They were just awesome. Some of them were in like the 80s, 90s. They kept going. I was amazing. They went to the Bible college. They studied there. They retired. They lived there. They retired. They never left. It was just that was another issue. But anyway, and I met them, and I kept hearing this word "nominal Christian." I had never heard that word before. I didn't grow up in a Christian context. I didn't. My mom, she wasn't Christian. She's not Christian as of yet. I didn't grow up in that context. A lot of the lingo I never heard. 
You want to talk about a nominal Christian? You ever heard that term? Yeah. Someone who's a Christian in name only. Yeah. They say they're Christian, but they really think they think they're Christian, but they're not. Yeah. Now, I started taking that to heart. If I think I'm a Christian and I'm not, how do I evaluate what I am? I took it really seriously. I was really trying to get my head around it. But if I think I'm something and I'm not, how do I evaluate where I really stand? <laughs> Boy, that sent me in a, in a, into a tiz. Can I tell you something that really helped me? What can help you when in your mind you might be doing this is you need an anchor for your soul that's outside you. From the eternal Word of God, where God cannot lie, doesn't change his mind, Amen. can be an anchor for your soul. Let's finish up here with verse 13. For just a moment. <laughs> the Apostle John is writing this. These things, everything before this, I'm going to suggest really all of John's writings head in this direction. <laughs> These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Let's pause there. So who is he writing to? Those who believe in the name of the Son of God. Who's the Son of God? Do you believe in the name of the Son of God? In other words, do you trust in Him? Okay, so that means he's writing to you. That's nice. I get a personal letter from the Apostle John. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So is he writing to you? Answer the question for yourself. Is he writing to you? If you don't believe in him, he's not writing to you. Because this is a message for those who believe in the name of Jesus, trusted in Jesus, the Son of God, trusting in what he's done, his death, his burial, his resurrection, trusting in him. He's the Savior. He's Lord, trusting in Him. You've trusted in Him. You believed in Him. There came a moment that you crossed over from being not having the Son to having the Son. Through that little gate, taking that, that off the broad way that led to destruction, you took the little gate who is Christ. Jesus is the gate. Whoever enters in through Him shall be saved. He's the way, the truth, and the life. You entered to Him. You went to Him. You came to Him. You put your trust in Him. You fled from your life. You, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. Save me, Jesus. Have mercy on me, a sinner, Jesus. And you put your trust in the name of the Son of God. He's writing to you. By the way, that word for turning... It's called repentance. You changed your mind and now it's him you follow. Notice what he says. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of, the name of, the Son of God so that you might feel you might have feel that you have eternal life. Is that what it says? That you may what? No. Oh, that's different. That you might what? That's calculating. How much is one plus one? You sure? How do you know? Because <laughs> it's true. It's actually verifiable, isn't it? I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you might know. So that you may know, so that you may know, not feel, that you may what? Okay, do me a favor, put your finger in the Bible there, and I want you to close your Bible for a moment. Just keep your finger there for a second. Okay, shake it up. Okay, now I want you to look at that same verse again for me. Look at the same verse again. Does it say the same thing? It hasn't changed. So if I put this on my shelf for the week, 
Hopefully I don't. That's not a wise thing to do. But I opened it up next Sunday. Would it say the same thing? So it doesn't change. Because the testimony of God is consistent. It's true. It's complete. He says this is the way it is. So that you can know, so that you can rest your heart fully on the assurance of what he said, not how you feel, of what he said, what Jesus has done, who Christ is. I can fully trust. It's outside of me. (laughs) What's that one guy? He was the astrophysicist in a wheelchair. What's his name? Huh? Stephen Hawking. Wrote a book, didn't he? He had this theory about everything he was going to come up with. And the end of it, he says, you can't. You have to be outside the system to be able to see what's in the system, to be able to make whatever that is that has to be to link everything else together. Gee, that's God. But my adherence is outside my box. So I have an anchor for my soul that isn't dependent on what I think or what I feel. I trust in what another has said because he's infallible. You catch this? If you'll take this to heart, I'm telling you, those of you who might struggle, it'll, it'll vanish because your faith in the word of God is your security blanket. It is your, um, your inoculation against the, the accusations of the devil that you're never good enough because it's in Jesus that you put your trust and he alone gives eternal life. And if you have the son you have, life. These things I've written to you, believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, some translations leave out that last little sentence. I don't think that's a good translator. And that you may continue because that's the context. That's what it means here. That you've believed and you continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. In other words, it isn't, I prayed a prayer and now I'm going to go my own way. That's not believing in Jesus. If you believe that Jesus is king, heaven, creation, death, king of kings, and he is king of you, then not to follow him is pretty stupid. Isn't it? In fact, I'm going to suggest to you it's worse than that because it'll cost you your soul. So don't deceive yourself because you just prayed a prayer, but you follow him and you continue to rely, adhere to, trust in Jesus, the Son of God. And you'll find the joy of that eternal life will grow in that relationship with him. He loves you. He paid it all so that you could be his. He doesn't give up what's his. My life is hidden with Christ in God. And those who have the Son have life. And so, so is yours. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you that you're truthful. Thank you that you don't change. And I pray for each one here. I pray for those that don't know you. I pray that you would help them this day, that they would put their trust in Christ, who is the Son of God, and they would have life in his name. They'll call to you and ask you to be king of their heart. I pray for those that are yours, and they've struggled, been unsure. I pray that even today you would settle this in their heart, that they don't ever have to go back and revisit this, that they may know, they may be wholly assured, settled in mind, settled in heart, knowing to whom they belong. I pray for us, Lord, may already know and believe in Christ and we do believe that we are yours. Lord, I pray for that we'll be a people who continue to believe, continue to walk, continue to trust and adhere to Christ. No turning back. 
no turning back. We just thank you for your eternal life that's in your Son. Bless each one for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. I'm going to sing a song as we close. If you want prayer for anything, I'd invite you as we're singing this last song that you can come and receive prayer. If you've, if you've not trusted in Christ and you want someone to kind of pray with you, I'd come and pray with someone and receive the gift of eternal life, which is in Christ. Amen.